I would uh, invite Michelle to join me uh, at the stage here. So Michelle Lynn is a co-founder, head of strategy at Mantis Research. It's a consultancy focused on helping marketers conduct and publish original research. A lot of the original research studies you've seen at very popular blogs you all read and love actually done by Mantis Research. So Michelle, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm gonna take it away. So as Pep was just talking about, what we're gonna be talking about today is original research. And what specifically we're gonna be talking about today is how to conduct survey-based research. Here we go, okay. Oops, my apologies. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen, sorry about that. But in any case, I am so excited to be here today to talk about what I think is what is such a wonderful opportunity in content marketing today, and that is creating survey-based research. And like, like Pep alluded to, there's a lot of different types of research out there. There's the original research that you know you guys were just talking about. So I'm gonna get on the same page of what we're gonna be talking about today, just so we're super clear. And we're gonna be talking about survey-based research. And this was the kind of research that David just alluded to, the state of inbound. Um, and it's also research like this. This is some research that you might have seen. This comes from CMI and Marketing Profs. And this is their annual B2B content marketing budgets, benchmarks, and trends report. And what they do is they go out and they survey their audience to really understand what is going on in the industry. They then take those findings and then they report them back out so that their audience can really get a good sense of what's going on in the industry. And here's the thing about research, like just like you know, Pat mentioned, it, it works. Like you can look at it through so many different examples, so many different clients who've done this. It just works really well. But the thing that is not so simple, the thing that really can can mess people up, is the actual process. So how do you do this? And how do you do this in a way that's credible and meaningful and so forth? So we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so really trying to untangle this process and simplify it for you and really specifically focus on what are those things that you can do that you're not even thinking that you even need to do to make your research project better. So I'm gonna take you through 10 steps, and we're also gonna be focused on a case study. And I really wanted to make sure that this isn't just theory, that you guys can actually see this, this process in, in practice and you can see how it's going to work. And the case study that we're talking about today is the state of writing, which was a collaboration from a content marketing writing agency, Typeset, and at my organization, Mantis. And the thing I think is really interesting about this particular project is that, you know, Typeset came to me in 2019. They said, you know what? We're launching a new business. We want to build our editorial on a piece of original research. And we want to do this study every single year because, you know, having data to back what we believe and having data to have these conversations is really useful. And the other interesting thing about this particular project, which I think is, is useful, is their timing was terrible. They launched their first annual study last year in February 2020, right before the pandemic, when the world just paused. So even though their timing couldn't have been worse, and even though they were scrappy, their founder, she's told me, you know, the initial return on investment in original research is already proving to be far more fruitful than any other marketing that we've done to date. And in the case of, of Typeset, what they were trying to do was to get their brand out there. They really wanted to build their email list. Um, as you can see, in the first two months, they increased their email list substantially which is pretty incredible, again, considering the, the, that the pandemic you know, closed things down in March. In the first month, their domain authority went up 10 points. It's obviously since gone up much more since then. But original research doesn't just work for these quick wins. There's a lot of long-term effects too. And Sarah was invited to speak on podcasts. She was invited to keynote events. And she was invited to participate in a lot of different articles and interviews all surrounding this research. So it was an ideal way for them to get their name out. And I want to show you guys how you can do the exact same thing. So before we get in, into you know, these 10 steps, I want to focus on something, this one word, idea. 
because it really clarifies those things that you need to be focused on no matter where you are in the process, no matter what it is that you're doing. And it works like this. If you want your research to make an impact to your audience, to your marketing, to your business goals, you need to do three things. The first thing is you need to have data. And specifically, you need to have credible data. There's a lot of data credibility issues in this space, which we're going to touch on. But credible data is a, is a must. It's table stakes. The second thing you need is you need to make sure that you can explore this data to find insights, to find stories, to find meaning. Data point after data point is just not all that useful. And then the third thing you need to do is you need to have a plan for your findings. You need to amplify it. And this is no surprise. It's, this is obvious, but so many marketers go through this whole process and they just don't, and they just kind of like let things kind of fall off on the back end. So we're, again, we're going to go through 10 steps and we're going to talk about how each of these steps helps with making your data more credible, your story stronger, and your findings get out there more. So the first thing you need to do is you need to determine what is your research topic. And there are three things that make a really good survey-based research topic. The first thing is it needs to be meaningful to your audience. The second thing is it needs to align with your brand. And the third thing is that it needs to say something new. And this third part, the saying something new, is what I think really gets marketers, you know, this is the biggest miss. And what you need to do is you need to focus on which, what are the unanswered questions out there and how can I help answer those questions? With, with survey data specifically. For instance, some, some questions you want to answer, you know, if you want to understand um, how people are actually be behaving, it's much better to, to do, you know, um, look at user data. But if you're trying to understand how people feel about things, these are the type of questions that survey-based research can answer really well. So again, I'm not suggesting that, you know, anyone replicate what, what CMI has has done, and even though you know types it is in the content marketing space, I also didn't tell them, you know what, look at what's worked so really, look what's worked so well for CMI and marketing pros. You should do this the do the same. Instead, we had to focus on something entirely different, so they had their own questions to answer. And what they decided to do was to focus on on writing effectiveness. They really wanted to understand what our business is doing. Is the writing having an impact? What impact is it having? And so forth. So once you have your topic determined that's really unique to you and, and your brand, the next step is you need to figure out who you're going to survey and you need to figure out how you're going to find these people. So even though we're all in, in B2B, I want to make sure that you guys are thinking about one possibility and that is getting a consumer panel. Because in sometimes what you can do is you can say, you know what, we really are curious how U.S. adults, for instance, feel about you know, I worked in a study that we wanted to understand how U.S. adults felt about publishers and about different written content. And so we sourced a B2C panel. It worked great. And these consumer-based panels, there's lots of panel companies out there. I mean, you do need to watch for, for quality and so forth. But this is a very accessible, low-cost way to do research. But if you're like many people I talk to, you're like, you know what? I don't want to go after a consumer audience. I really want to understand more about B2B professionals. And you have three ways you can get to this. The first thing you can do is you can really is you can reach out to you out to your own email list. So if you have a large engaged email list of those who are representative of those you want to survey, so that's really important, you can certainly use that, use that list. Now, the, of course, there's going to be a bit of, of bias in there, but there's a lot of ways to think about that and be transparent about that and so forth. And I think your results can still be completely effective. Now, for most of us, for many of us, we don't have this huge, large list. So your next best option is to form a partnership. So who wants to answer those same questions that you're trying to answer and who has a large list? And if you can find a partner who wants to do that, this can be really, really effective. I'm more than happy to answer questions about partnerships and, and, and so forth, because I think it's a great opportunity you know, for many people out there. And then your third option, and one I would use very much with caution, is to use a B2B panel. Now, I am so excited that Winter's out there. I'm so excited that Pep and team are building these panels of really, really credible B2B marketers because I'll be honest, this is just, uh, this is a big gap in our industry right now and it's really hard to find great quality B2B panels. 
And the other thing is these panels are typically pretty ex expensive. So if that's your only option, I would definitely proceed with caution. Um, but you know, we could, there's always ways to figure it out. Okay. So now once you've figured out what your topic is, who you're gonna survey, the next thing is you're gonna wanna start writing your survey. And what you wanna do is you wanna start thinking about, okay, what are those demographic details I wanna collect? Now demographics, you guys have a copy of this presentation. Um, there's also, I meant to mention, there's also a um, cheat sheet that I'm gonna link to at the end with all of this information and some other resources as, as well. But B2B demographics are things like your industry, your years of experience, B2C demographics are things like your age or your generation, your level of education, and so forth. And even if you're using your own list, you wanna make sure that you're asking about some of these demographics, I would say at least two or three, just so you get a good sense of, of who your audience is. Because you're going to need to put together a methodology. You're gonna to need to say, you know, this is who I surveyed, this is how I, I found responses, you know, these, these are the demographics, and so forth. Because I've seen methodologies like this, this actually came from an actual research company. When they, this was the whole methodology. They said the survey was fielded to a panel of marketing influencers and marketing research subscribers. Of course, that just makes you cringe. You know nothing about this audience. It doesn't feel credible. You know, it's just about as good as having no methodology at all. And what we find, we've done some research with Basumo about this. What we find is a third of people who do survey-based research research are not even publishing their methodology. So again, this should be table stakes. If you do a survey, you publish your, your methodology. And I have an example in that cheat sheet at the end if you wanna get a sample of how to write this. Okay, next. So you, once you decide what kind of demographic details you wanna collect, you're not done with your audience yet. Because one of the things I think so many marketers miss, and I think it's very unintentional because they don't think to do it, is you need to make a decision of who you are not going to let take your survey. Because again, you wanna make sure that your data is as credible as possible, and it's better to have smaller numbers than it is to have these big numbers of the wrong people. So in the state of, of, of writing, again, we're looking to understand writing effectiveness in a business, we asked two questions. The first we said, are you involved in the writing or editorial process for a business? Only those people who answered yes went through. Everyone else, you said, you know, thanks for your time. We don't need any additional info. And we also asked this question, what is the primary role in the business? And what we did here is that we, anyone who said freelance writer or editor, we also had them exit. And even though we knew we'd get a lot of these freelance writers and editors to answer this, the survey, they weren't our ideal audience because we wanted to understand the role of writing effectiveness in a business. And these freelancers often write, work for so many different businesses, it was gonna be hard for us to, to get the right information from them. So it's okay to make decisions to get to the right people even if your sample size is gonna be smaller. Okay, now, so the next thing you wanna do is you're gonna start thinking about your questions. And before you start writing the actual survey questions, I highly recommend that you craft your table of contents in advance. And this is basically, you know, three to five categories that you're gonna put all of your different questions in. And if you're new to research, maybe if you have a, a small, you know, 10 question survey, you don't need to do this. But if you're looking to do a, bit, a bigger benchmarking study like HouseBot does or CMI does, it's really helpful to choose these categories because it's gonna make writing questions easier. It's gonna make the data analysis easier and it's gonna make storytelling easier because you can look at this data within the chunks instead of everything all together, which can just start to feel a bit overwhelming. So in the state of writing, we have four different categories. So the first thing we looked at was a content overview. We wanted to study you know, what type of content people are producing, if it's worth the investment um, and so forth. We have a whole section about the writing process. So do you use an editorial calendar? Do you have someone who oversees your process? Do you have a proofreader? Um, we also looked at SEO. So we wanted to understand what priority SEO is for organizations and what steps they're taking. And then we also wanted to understand the impact of their writing. Is it effective? So what results were they trying to achieve and what results did they actually get to? So once you have your buckets, 
Now you can start writing your actual survey questions. And I could do a whole presentation on just survey questions al alone. But the thing I want you guys to think about here, the thing I think is the biggest missed opportunity is so many surveys out there do what's called taking an inventory. And they basically say, you know what, we want to know as much about our industry as possible. And there's nothing inherently wrong with this. I mean, this is this could be some great stats that people link to your website time and time again. But I also want to make sure that the survey that you're that you're fielding also tells a story. It needs to answer, so what? Why is this meaningful to your audience? How will this elevate your brand? Why will they see your brand as a company you they really need to go to? So there's a lot of different ways to do this, but I'm going to take you through three different examples so you can start to see how survey data can be used to tell interesting stories. So the first thing you can do is you can expose a disconnect. So in the case of typeset, we ask these two different questions. You know, first, does your organization plan to increase or decrease the amount of writing they produce in the next 12 months? And then the second thing we asked is, does your organization plan to increase or decrease your budget for written content over the next 12 months? And what we found in 2020 was that 57% of business communicators plan to write more, but only 30% plan to increase their budget. And as you can see, one of these stats by themselves is, you know, moderately interest, interesting at best. But when you look at these stats together, that's when the story, you know, appears. That's when you can see that friction. And when you have that friction, that's when you can have a really interesting conversation. So I took this data out to LinkedIn. And for what it's worth, like I said, we published this study at a terrible time. I took it out, you know, months after it was published. So these conversations are good for, you know, many months. And I basically said, here's what we found. And I asked the question, does it make sense for companies to focus on creating more content if they aren't willing to invest more? And we had a really good conversation because some people, most people said, of course you need to invest more. And some people are like, you know what, you can get it, it, it done. Okay, next. Surveys are also great if you want to uncover a pain point. And this is someone raising their hand saying, you know what, I'm challenged or I'm frustrated. So in this particular case, we asked a question, how easy or difficult is each of these steps in the writing process? And as a quick aside, we didn't say difficult because we don't want to lead. So we just want to say, is this easy to do or is this difficult to do? And what we found last year and what we found out in the study that's coming, it's going to be published in the next several weeks is the thing that's most difficult for marketers to do, and you might, you might feel the same way, is that people don't know what their audience wants to read. <laughs> which it's, it's, it seems kind of like, uh. but at the same time, and this is another great jumping off place for a, a story. So typeset can say, you know what, here's all these different ways that you can help learn what your audience wants to read. They can be a support to this challenge. And the last thing you can do is you can use your survey data to reveal a gap or an opportunity. So this year, when we ran the survey again, we knew that knowing what your audience wants to read is a pain point. So we asked, how do you determine what content your audience wants to read? And we gave them this list of options, which I believe that we randomized. And what we found, this is not probably not, this is sad, maybe not surprising, but you know, marketers are using all these things like analytics and social media, and they even talk to their customers, support and their sales teams, but they aren't talking to their customers, which just like, ah. Uh, um, and again, you know, I'm so glad that companies like Winter are now in the mix. So you can use, you know, you can use those tools to really understand what your audience wants to read to. Okay, so you have your questions written, you're feeling good, you're going to tell a story. Your next step is to simplify the language in your survey. Because we're marketers, this happens, I see this all the time. This little comic, this guy says, so what do you do, Jake? And Jake says, we create award-winning custom outdoor living spaces. And this guy's like, oh, you're a landscaper. Mm -hmm. And we, we so often get caught up in the world of, of Jake where we're using marketing jargon. And it has no place in, in any of this, of course. But it really has no place in surveys. Get it out of there because people don't understand it. At least maybe not all of your survey takers. But even those things that seem really innocuous can cause problems too. So here's a question of a survey question gone bad. This question asks, how long does it take to produce an average page of content? Now this question has multiple problems, but let's just look at this word produce. What does this mean? Does it mean to write? Does it mean to edit? 
Does it mean to optimize? Does it mean to load? And because everyone who's answering this survey is going to be looking at this, defining the score differently, they're going to be answering it with a different lens. The data you get back is it just isn't isn't credible, and it certainly can't benchmark like this particular study was trying to do. So I highly, highly recommend that you ask people outside of your inner circle, not people who talk in the same words that you talk in, to test your survey. If you have editors out there, they make great survey testers. They love to poke holes. They love to ask why. They love to ask who cares. Um, so they're great testers. Next, clean your data. So many marketers I talk to, or so many marketers who run surveys, what they care about is the number of responses. They think higher numbers equals more credible data. And this drives me crazy because you don't know who those people are taking your surveys. And you and there is a you know, there is a level of quality issues with survey data. data. I'm not gonna lie to you. So what you need to do is you need to balance the number of responses with the quality of data. Even if that means your, your data set's gonna be smaller, there's things that you can do to, to check for, for quality. And I don't have time to go into a lot of ideas right now. I'm happy to answer questions on this. But you know, one simple idea that I recommend everybody do is to ask at least one writing question, preferably more in every single survey. Because especially with B2B professionals, you will use this to, to clean your, your data. You're gonna find people who have no idea what they're talking about. Those are people you get out of that survey as fast as you can because chances are their other data isn't, isn't credible either. Okay, so once you have all your data back, you're finding your stories that you've, you know, try to uncover with, with the questions that you asked, it's now time to launch your findings. And here's the thing, I'm working on a presentation right now that's, that, that's called, you know, how to create a year's worth of content from one research study. So I could go into much more detail, but in the time that we have left, here's what I want you to know. Here's what you guys to be thinking about. Choose one page, this can be, a blog post, Andy Crestedina, who's speaking later today, he has a fabulous blogging study. It's been so wildly successful for him. Every link goes to this page. Or you might wanna do something like JetBrains does. They have a great, great developer study that they do each, each year. And it's a lot more visual with their findings. And again, I, I link to these in the, in the cheat sheet. But, the, but the, the point is, choose one page. It's not a PDF. It is not a form, but a page that's built for SEO. And then on that page, have a next step. So what is that thing you want people to do to engage with your brand more? And this is where I think a lot of marketers just, just forget about this step because they just, they're so busy with all of the details, but decide how you want people to engage with your brand now that you've sent all these people here. Okay, so for in the case of Typeset, what did they do? They have a blog post and their call to action is to subscribe to their newsletter. And as you can see, their newsletter subscriptions increased. And then the last thing you need to do is you need to amplify. So even once your research is out, it's not just done. You need to start parsing off all of these little really interesting stories and, and sharing them in different ways. So you're gonna have all of your amplification assets point to your one page, which will point to your next step. And if you aren't sure where to get started, this is what I highly recommend you do. Think about what is the goal of your research? Is it backlinks, is it leads, is it thought leadership, and how are you already marketing? And right there is gonna be your best, easiest things to do. And this is just a really quick chart with, with some thought starters of different things that you can do with your research. Again, there's much more, I'm happy to answer questions, you know, now, later, um, but there are many different ways that you can parse out the findings of your research in many different ways and many different channels. So we're gonna, go, we're gonna revisit this word one more time just so it's super clear. So again, if you guys wanna create survey-based research that makes an impact, make sure you have credible data, make sure the data tells a compelling story, and make sure you have a plan for your finding. And with that, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them now, later, reach out, on, I'm active on LinkedIn. You know, I'm very approachable, love talking about this stuff. You reach out via email anytime, let me know how I can help. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, we do have uh, time for questions here, so let's uh, let's get um, going. How can you produce statistically relevant polls that actually do a good job to attempt to gather information on the whole industry? So I guess the question is about sample sizes and also representative samples. 
So, I mean, the, I mean, it's, are you, I will say the answer is slightly different for B2B than it is for B2C. If you're doing a consumer-based study where it's much easier to access that, I mean, I would definitely have, you know, I would say 1,000, 1,500 people. The other thing that you need to be thinking about, are, are you trying to compare different segments? So do you want to understand how Gen X is different than baby boomers versus millennials? You need to make sure you have a, a representative um, sample in each of those segments if you want to do those comparisons. In B2B, honestly, I think it depends on how niche your audience is. A lot of time people will be fine with a smaller sample size if the, de if the data is you know, collected in a really meaningful way. So there isn't any like exact number, but if you are interested, there's a lot of different um, calculators out there that you can use, like sample size calculators, to get you know some some information. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, CXL sample size calculator, the best in business. Uh, you mentioned partnerships, so I am actually very interested in this question. So, bit of context uh, with CXL, we do annual conversion optimization state of the industry survey. And we predominantly survey our own email list, which is um, substantial. But we always try to partner with an A-B testing tool. You know, some, somebody who is also interested in this topic, who's not a direct competitor, everybody wins. However, what ends up happening is that every single year, we are disappointed by how little responses our partners are able to get. Uh, so in the CRO, conversion optimization space, there is nobody that can even offer even remotely same amount of responses that we as CXL can. So it's been a problem. So how do you choose a partner that can actually, you know, deliver responses? So, I mean, you're right. Some of this is going to be trial and error. Sometimes you think you have a great partner and it just doesn't pan out. But I'm a very big believer in laying up what that partnership is going to look like up, up front. So like I have a template I'm happy to share with people to say, this is what we're going to do. This is what you have to do. This is what we have to do. This is what you're going to get. And you can even say, like, if you get X number of responses, we will do this for you. So you can certainly do, do, do that. Um, another idea, which I haven't tried yet, but I've, I've thought about with other clients, is, if you, is, is there a way that you can run a data set just for them? Not that they would publish out, but they could see how their their audience responds to these questions that might give them more impetus to get it out more to to because they're going to get something that's specific to their brand back mm -hmm. yeah absolutely uh people already um drooling on your template here in the chat i see uh, i will so... add it to the cheat sheet it's not there but i'll add it after this call beautiful uh all right so thank you very much uh, michelle uh, mantisresearch.com uh also are you active on linkedin or twitter where should we connect with you yeah so i don't know if you saw the end the end slides in the cheat sheet too linkedin's great i am on twitter not as as much um even reach out via email whatever i can do to be helpful i would love to support people's endeavors awesome thank you michelle